Hi, I'm John Cutterback. And I'm Sophia Cutterback. If you're wondering whether you can really be friends with your spouse. And raise children into responsible adults with whom you have a relationship. And do what it takes to make a homestead. Reconnecting with your body and the land, wherever you live. If you just want to think more about how to make a truly happy home in our trying times. Then the Intentional Household, a Lifecraft podcast is for you. Join Join us. us. Welcome, everybody, to today's episode. Always happy to be with my wife, Sophia, and today is five non-negotiables to instill in your children. This came up at at, uh, our recent Lifecraft day at the barn, didn't it? Yeah, it sure did. Why don't you share with that that experience, the question that was actually asked us at Lifecraft day that kind of gave rise to our thinking, oh, we should, we might have to have a discussion about that. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, it really did strike us, didn't it? So this was in the question and answer period, a, a, you know, a young father just raised his hand and said, um, if you were to make the short list of non-negotiables to instill in your children that you're trying to form in your children, what would that be? Mm-hmm. And, you know, it caught me a little bit off, off guard. I love mm-hmm. lists. But, you know, there's always lots more lists that we haven't made. And this was just a great occasion for me to say, hmm, you know, it, it's not, you have to be careful that a list doesn't absolutely restrict whatever sure. we're talking about yeah. to being just this, but it can be very helpful mm-hmm. to ask that question, to answer that question. What are we especially focusing on? So that's why, I mean, we found ourselves, uh, you know, talking about that more because really I kind of put, we came up with a few and a few of those are the ones we're going to put in our list right now, but it was, it was fun to be caught off guard to, okay, what would we immediately think of? But now upon thinking about it a little bit more, we want to continue this discussion here because we've, we've come up with this list and we kind of wanted to go back and, and share this and keep this discussion going. Yeah. Yeah. It was interesting when um, this gentleman asked us that question, I just had this feeling of like, while we talk about what things to instill in our children all the time. And in a certain sense, it's a constantly evolving list. So it was kind of fun to sit down and kind of do a retrospective, so to speak, and say, okay, well, if we were to distill what has been our effort, what five things would we distill them in? And then also just gave rise to the question of, you know, what what is the importance of having that list? Is it enough to just kind of have principles that you're always talking about and you're keeping present in the family is it helpful to have a list? Do you, do you, yeah. do you, I mean, that's kind of something that maybe at the end of the podcast we would talk about, but I don't know. What do you think? Do you think that it's important to have a list or is it kind of just good to have general ideas that you're constantly working on and chewing on together as a couple and as parents in the home? Yeah, well, uh, good, good question. I, I mean, I, li- I like lists mm-hmm. and I think some people are more list people because one thing that you chew, no, the list does for you is it keeps those things present in your mind. Yeah, absolutely. But obviously what's yeah. most important here, I'd say, we always love the theme of intentionality. Mm-hmm. And here, the whole point here, why this strikes me as very much worth doing is uh, parenting needs to be a very intentional thing, mm-hmm. especially today. And it, otherwise it's so easy to miss very important things. Sure. And so, you know, when we right now put in our list of, I think it's number four on the five we're going to list when we say kindness, it, it, if, in any case, I think it's interesting that to recognize we have prioritized that mm-hmm. and we can keep asking ourselves, some of the people listening in this can ask themselves whether they like this list. Mm-hmm. Is it worth prioritizing mm-hmm. kindness? And then that's something that makes us act differently toward and with our children mm-hmm. uh, throughout the day, throughout mm-hmm. the week, throughout the life. Mm-hmm. And, and so I, I just, I, I do think it's fundamentally a matter of keeping key things foremost in mind so that the actions we're doing are tending well towards the ends that we've decided we want to go for. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That so, all right. So let's let, let's go ahead and jump in. So, right. so there's not an absolute order to this, but there's a little bit of an order to it. We put piety first. Mm-hmm. So, on on we're, we're making a list of five here, and so the first one is piety. Well, uh, can I ask um, if there's a list of five? Do you think it would be helpful to just say what the five are and then go into it, or yes, do you want absolutely. to hold no, them in no, surprise? No, no, no. That's all right. Like, okay. No, I, I, absolutely. <laughs> Number two is 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 a double um, respect and obedience. 
and they, they could have been separated out because they are distinct, but they're very closely related to mm -hmm. one another. So I've put that one second. So we have piety as the first, respect slash obedience as the second. And the third, um, we said responsibility. I know mm -hmm. I, haven't, I haven't shared with you the order I put them in. We've talked about all these. Mm -hmm. But the third is responsibility slash a good work ethic. Mm -hmm. Then I put kindness and finally gratitude. Okay, great, super. All right, so so I, I'm, I'm thinking here, part of, of, of the approach here before we go into them individually is to, is to recognize, all right, so we're setting our sights on these. We want to instill these in our children. Let's just remind ourselves of this. I always like to go back to gardening. We're cultivating, when we say instill, we, we can't just put them in. Mm -hmm. Just like you can't just put vegetables that are plants that are bearing fruit in your garden. You can't just put the fruit in the garden. Mm -hmm. These, as it were, are fruits that we're trying to cultivate. Mm -hmm. And so the, the point will be the the goals that we want to be cultivating, bringing about, raising our children up in such a way that these are being formed in them. No matter how well you cultivate your garden, you can't absolutely assure that certain fruits will succeed, that mm -hmm. the, the, the will come to fruition. Mm -hmm. So I just think it's important to bear in mind here, when we say non-negotiables, and I, I perhaps this is what the gentleman meant, if not, that's worth just having a word on. I, I, I think he meant, hey, what definitely for sure should we be aiming at? Mm -hmm. And that's exactly how I think we're answering the question mm -hmm. here. Here's what we're going to absolutely set our sights on. This is what we're absolutely going to be aware of, be thinking, deliberating, discussing, praying about, mm -hmm. looking for new ways to try to bring about in our children. And then you know, whether and how exactly that fruit grows will depend upon a number of things. But we need to be doing our part as the gardener knows he needs to do his part. He needs to do his best. And of course, the truth is, in general, you know, the fruits do very much tends to correspond to how well we cultivate it. Sure, yeah. They tend to, mm -hmm. right? And, and in any case, it, it, it certainly is so worthwhile. Mm -hmm. We want to have been cultivating these things regardless of exactly how successful we are. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Uh, uh, it really strikes strikes me, and you're saying this, that when we say the non-negotiables to instill in your children, the non-negotiable seems to more refer to our focus as parents, not necessarily non-negotiable, you do this child or you're yeah, out, right? Yeah, exactly, so, so when exactly. we say non-negotiable, because it's interesting, I, I, I even in just hearing the phrase when we first started our conversation, I just automatically kind of in my mind had this image of, okay, well, if you don't clean your room, right. here are the yeah, consequences. Yeah, exactly. And of course, there are going to be a variety of ways in which we encourage them. And sometimes they are with the consequence. If you don't, then. But it's not that we look at our children and say, everyone in my family is going to be kind or else. You know, no, sure. it's, it's, right. the non negotiable is actually applying to our focus as parents. Exactly. Rather and, than the children's performance. And that's what yeah. I guess what you're saying when you say the fruit, there are many other factors that affect what grows out of the garden. But our focus has to be on how we cultivate and foster because that's what's in our control. Right. Exactly. Great. And Super. I think, and, and you're putting it that way, it makes my mind, what does, where the term non-negotiable come from? Something that we're not willing to negotiate, <laughs> bless you, with a person about. And so if this is a non-negotiable, it's in a sense non-negotiable between us in what we're going to be doing in the sure. home. Yeah. Not So it's like we, we're not going to negotiate mm -hmm. this. I can hear Aquinas saying something like this. This is a given that we're going to be trying to instill this. We're not going to negotiate about, negotiate about whether to instill this, sure. we, or we, put time we, we might negotiate it, about yeah. how to instill right. it, but that we're going for these yeah. is non-negotiable. Great. Then with, 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 with the children, uh, you know, their separate issue of, well, if they're not doing this, what do we do? Mm -hmm. that, that the whole thing of kind of correction, admonition, punishment, great issue, another discussion. Yeah. So let me ask before we continue with the individual items on the list, is there a reason that you put these 
um, principles in the order that you did? Like, is, is it just, these are five imp equally important things are some of them prior? I mean, obviously some of this will come out as we discuss the individual, but just so we yeah, know, getting started, why did enough. you put them in that order? I, I, I would just say, this is one of those lists where the order is not super important. Okay, super. Uh, other than um, kind of the first, I, I, I wanted to start with piety because it has to do with our relationship with God. And in, in a sense, I think it's in certain ways foundational mm -hmm. regarding as regards all the others. And then, and then honestly, that I put gratitude last. I thought that it, 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 you know, from you and I have thought about this a lot together, uh, remembering something that your father, uh, God rest his soul, that he told us so long ago about the importance of instilling gratitude. It in certain ways sums up and brings together. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to end with that, but beyond yeah. that, let's not make, make, make a big deal. But okay. thanks for asking because, yeah. you know, order is always important. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So piety, I mean, here, this is something that St. Thomas Aquinas simply defines. There's a, there's a virtue that he calls piety, and it's it it, it particularly, um, or in any case, the way that we're using it here has to do with a kind of justice that uh, relates to God. Mm -hmm. I think he I think he actually might call it devotion, and piety can be used actually to name a relationship towards parents, but in our common parlance. Piety particularly has to do, and also this is rooted in the Greeks, a relationship to God, although you can talk about a piety towards parents, but that's what I'm going to put under the second one with respect and obedience. So here when I say pi piety, I mean an attitude towards God of, of wanting to worship him, mm -hmm. of kind of relating our whole life to service of God kind of culminating in worshiping him. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I, at this point, we, we don't have to worry about kind of the, you know, the technicalities of what exactly is, okay, is this a virtue? What, you know, what exactly mm -hmm. are its parameters? I just, here, I mean, I thought this was the best word to capture a disposition that kind of at the root of our heart and what we're seeking in life is that we serve God we we render what is due to him we want ultimately indeed to praise him not just mm -hmm. to not just to not just to serve him as a slave would but mm -hmm. to but to praise his goodness which is related to uh, i mean these are going to connect with one another a certain gratitude of course gratitude mm -hmm. is ultimately towards god but but piety kind of a, this foundational attitude disposition of our life is about responding to a call from God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, would you say that added to that? I mean, because I'm thinking if you say it's a it's a kind of a, a justice, or orienting yourself in justice to God, um, is, is another way of describing it. Would this be an accurate other way of describing it? Is recognizing our relationship to God in that He has super abundantly in His generosity given us everything, and that's why we want to give him and it's interesting that totally kind yeah. of includes the notion of gratitude of course but that it's because he's so super abundantly given us everything that we orient ourselves to him in this way of honor respect otherwise if it could just become a little bit i'm just thinking of the reason i'm i'm kind of going in this direction, I'm thinking, instilling it in children. How do we instill it in children? Right. And it just seems piety in particular, right. piety in particular, like historically, I'm even thinking of novels of certain um, distorted characters in novels who are instilling quote unquote piety in their children. And it's through a terrible harshness and, right. you know, where the word justice, you know, in the really, in the Thomistic sense, there's this fullness when we say, he, you know, he says justice, it seems like you know, it, it has a fullness and a richness to it, but very much for us in kind of common parlance, justice is something yep. extremely exacting yeah. and narrow and unmerciful. And so um, it, it seems to me like if we think about piety is, an, is encouraging a response of total reverence and gratitude and respect because we recognize that God has given us all of these things in gratuity, that that would be really important in the way we try to foster it, foster it in our children so that it doesn't bring about fear or slavishness, but instead a, a deep inner attitude that makes the child open 
to everything that he receives as a gift. I love that. I, I think that's very fitting. And how about if we, how about if we say key here is um, God is your father and we owe him everything. Mm -hmm. God is the loving daddy who has, uh, who is the source of all good. He has created us. He has, he has loved us into existence. He calls us to share his life. Mm -hmm. He is a father who wants, as it were, to give everything, share his life with his children. Mm -hmm. th th this, this is the foundation, I think. So that, that in, 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 your, in your responding the way you did brings that more clearly into mind. And then, good, thank you. Let's keep, let's not get lost in kind of abstract definitions. Mm -hmm. What are we trying to instill in our children here? God is our father. We owe him everything. Our, our life is about responding and, and there's something due here. Mm -hmm. there, 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 there's something that is owed. And, mm -hmm. and I, I say this right now, I had a funny moment um, as I was thinking about just, you know, we've talked about a bit, I was thinking on my own when I was putting it in the order that I've shared here. And I had this moment where I just thought, what if someone just said, why are the non-negotiables the cardinal virtues? Mm -hmm. Aren't the cardinal virtues just kind of the, the, you know, the key to life? So wouldn't, wouldn't that be a good list of non-negotiables? I thought, hmm, well, it certainly wouldn't be a bad list of mm -hmm. non-negotiables. But then as I, as I thought about these things- Why don't you list things, the cardinal virtues? Cardinal virtues are justice, courage, temperance, mm -hmm. and prudence. Mm -hmm. Prudence being an intellectual kind of know-how, how to live the good life. And the others are more what we call moral dispositions. Justice about rendering what is due, Courage is about, as it were, overcoming our fear and being willing to endure hard and difficult things, and temperance is restraining our desires. Well, what struck me is, if you actually look at this list, basically everything in the list that you and I came up with is a matter of justice. Mm. And the neat thing, in the, without going into it, so in the traditional notion of those cardinal virtues, is that courage and temperance actually have their importance from serving justice. Mm. In other words, for instance, chastity, which is a kind of temperance, is so important because it helps us to render what is due to everybody, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. men towards women in, in, our, in our marriage, mm -hmm. towards our children, towards society. Courage empowers us to render what is due. So in many ways, you might say, and this goes back to the great Greeks, Life is about rendering what is due. Mm -hmm. So justice is kind of that central one, even among the cardinal virtues. Mm -hmm. Well, interestingly, piety, if you go back to the Greeks, what they called piety, this is a Socrates moment, piety is a part of justice. It's that part mm -hmm. of justice that renders what is due to God. Mm -hmm. so, I, it, it, so we come back to what are we trying to instill in our children? It's um, our, our God is a father. It's all about love, but given what he has lovingly done for us, at root, there is this response that is due, something that we owe, and we, uh, it, it's a great gift and privilege that we owe this. Maybe this is a great part when we talk about instilling this. This is one of the most foundational ways that we're going to convey to our children that to owe something in justice is not a burden. Mm -hmm. To owe something in justice is an incredible gift. Yeah. It's a response to, to a gift. Yeah. Because that gift has been given by God, we owe something in response, and we should be so grateful that we do. Mm -hmm. So mama and daddy's you know, response, general approach in life is we're servants of God. We want everything we do to be ordered towards praising him, towards, do, towards, towards saying yes to what he has done for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can, can you, um, that is so beautiful, especially the whole notion of being, uh, uh, being restricted by what we owe someone is actually not a restriction. It's an invitation to flourishing. I just, all of a sudden, when you were describing that, I just had this feeling of like, ah, oh, wow, that's great. It's a little bit like a roadmap <laughs> that otherwise yeah. we might go off course. Before we go on, I just I, I want to draw you out a little bit. You mentioned the notion, the ancients' notion of piety, and I know you love that so much. When you know we encounter it in reading, you know, ancient literature or um, 
or you're, you're reading the philosophers, the whole notion of piety. I wonder if you could just use, I, I think it might be even helpful in thinking about what are we trying to instill in our children if we look at the ancient kind of notion, pagan notion of, for them, piety was really, really at the heart of things. Yeah, absolutely, and so it was. I, I, I love the description that you said that it was for the ancients, piety was rendering what was due to the gods. But, you know, we hear about Odysseus offering certain kind of piety to, um, mm -hmm. you know, the people that he meets or um, what's Odysseus's son's name? Telemachus. Tele Telemachus. Telemachus. You know, mm -hmm. the, the piety that he offers or the piety that's offered to um, guests when they come in. Can you just yeah. describe yeah, well, some of those well, scenes? And well, like, well, because it seems to me it just gives a natural context in which we go, oh, this is, you know, because sometimes when we talk about offering what is due God or the reverence that is due God, we automatically think the inside of a church, you know, folded hands. And we're, it sounds like you're trying to, I mean, obviously we're talking about fostering piety in the home. We're not talking about teaching our children to kneel or genuflect when they go in the church. We're talking about uh, in-home attitude, oh, that helps. right? Um, of course, that's part, part of it. Sure. That's part of it, but it's not restricted to that. And I no, think sometimes right. looking at the ancients, Good. Makes no, no, you realize the broader great. context. And, and, and the way that you frame the question, though, is also going to move us on uh, um, to our second of respect and obedience, yeah. because the, the very notion of piety was by them and is in Christianity. Uh, this is some, one of those things of just the richness of words. So we have to always be aware of that when we're using it. You can refer to piety towards God. That's the fundamental piety. But that's the kind of foundation for a kind of piety towards others. Which, interestingly, the home, of course, is always going to be the original home of piety because it, it, it naturally starts to arise in a child toward his parents. Mm. And so we might put it this way. There's something deeply naturally instilled in human persons where I think they have a natural religious sense, for sure. But also that come, it, it, it's deeply intertwined with their natural sense of, of piety towards their parents. And so, you know, we've heard said before, kind of God as father, very much intertwined with the experience of a child towards his parents, and especially towards his father, that that, that kind of reverence is going to come out, it's going to be cultivated there. So one and two are going to go together mm -hmm. very naturally here, piety towards God, piety, respect, obedience towards parents. But um, it, it, I, I, you, you mentioned the ancients, mom, and say something about it. How about even briefly just this, in the Aeneid, by Virgil, the great Roman work, one of the main ways that Aeneas is referred to is as pious Aeneas. Mm. Pious Aeneas. Here is a man who is pious. That The fundamental driving disposition in him, you know, it's, it's, it's why he's actually willing to leave the woman that he's fallen in love with in Dido. And because pious Aeneas is, un, comes to see it's shown to him, the gods are calling you on. Mm -hmm. And so his life is fundamentally a matter of service to the gods. That's beyond anything else. Mm -hmm. So it, it, I, I love you saying, let, let, let's bring that up and notice it because it's, this, is, this could be a fitting thing even to convey to children at the appropriate time, the appropriate way. Throughout history, um, people have always recognized we owe everything to the divine, mm -hmm. even though they haven't always understood that there's just one God, sure. but we owe everything to the divine, but they didn't necessarily understand and often did not understand. And no one did until the fuller revelation of kind of truly God as father, mm -hmm. this totally loving, gratuitous gift calling to share in his life, kind of as it were being invited into his home, a father inviting his children into his home. So you have this whole new level of, we have so much more of a foundation of, oh my goodness, what we have been given, what we have been offered, why for us, it's this even more joyful a calling to spend our life in service here, not to a more far away divinity, but to a very present, loving, paternal presence. Mm -hmm. But already in the Greeks, that, that kind of piety penetrated everything. It penetrated into how spouses related to one another, how you treat your guests. Mm -hmm. That was all kind of, so you could say piety kind of overflowed into everything because if you're going to serve the gods, the gods want you to honor your marriage. The gods want you to 
honor the guest. Mm -hmm. So that's how kind of piety overflowed. And now we, as Christians, have this richer sense also of, okay, piety. You know, so much to say here, so we'd better, mm -hmm. we'd better move on, but we'll be able to connect this nice mm -hmm. and you know, quickly to the second one. Although here. before we move on, and it's, it is a very clear connection to respect. You were just saying, we respect the guest. We welcome, th those are ways that we're teaching our children piety, but also beginning to teach them the next point, respect. But before we go on, I just wanted to ask, um, it strikes me that it's maybe um, pretty straightforward how to teach or mechanisms that you can use to teach children piety toward God. Like we said, yeah. you know, reverence and bodily demeanor in the appropriate time, praying before meals, you know, thanking God for things in the presence of the children. Those are all things that help us. But do you have any suggestions about, it's a little bit more complicated when you want to try to foster in the children um, piety toward their parent, because you are their parent, right? And so do you have any suggestion how to avoid what would seem a little bit of a trap where you say, you, you have to respect me. You have to have piety toward me. You know, I'm your parent. I mean, obviously, I think everybody can hear right away. That would be an absolutely horrible thing. But at the same time, you know, we kind of acknowledged from the beginning that sometimes we have to explicitly not just pattern for our children what is correct, which is super, super important, but there are also ways of explicitly directing them. Do you have any yeah. thoughts or suggestions okay. about how that would be done? I do. And of course, again, really, you are then asking about number two, really, right. because piety there towards the parents is what we're going to mean sure. by respect okay, to number two, which is, fine, which is fine. But let me put it this way, because now's the perfect moment to ask that, because I would say the, the key to instilling that, and now here there, a, a certain order between these becomes more apparent, that uh, a key way to properly instill respect towards parents is to have made more foundational piety towards God. Mm. That that is first and it's the reason. Mm -hmm. It really is, it's the most root reason for uh, respect towards parents mm. also. Yeah. That, so I, I mean, that that, yeah. that I think is 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 gonna be the main thing, but, uh, but um, it, it, and we can keep going with that. So thanks very much for asking that. And if we just wrap up kind of explicitly on number one, we should have made clear the term piety very often is used for like someone who prays fervently, which is great and fitting, but piety here is being used in a much broader sense. So instilling piety isn't just, we have to have these prayer times and we do, we do set aside prayer times as part of this broader sense of our whole life is about serving God. And because of that, by a natural order given us by God, we, we set aside certain times to honor him, to praise him, to make petition to him. But but piety is obviously not just about Sunday. Piety truly is this fundamental disposition of everything I do is a kind of worship. Mm -hmm. Everything I do should be mm -hmm. in service to God mm -hmm. in, in a loving way because he is my father, mm -hmm. because he wants to share everything with me. Mm -hmm. I We owe him everything. So to speak in these ways, to be, to be, to be having our, to be trying to convey to our children, it is such a gift and honor <laughs> that we, that we owe God this, that he's put us in this wonderful situation where he's given us this great gratuitous gift of everything that we have. And so we are so joyful to turn around and return everything to him that to speak that way and then act that way in, in very concrete things. Okay, we're excited now to, to for prayer time. I mean, there, there's in certain ways where rubber meets the road. Are we complaining when we're going off to, to church or are we having a sense of, 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 of we need to be patterning? We're so happy to have this opportunity. We're not just knocking this one off the checklist. It's a continuation of the celebration of our life. It just Amen. really strikes me that what you're talking about is cultivating an attitude. And of course we said at the beginning, non-negotiables for the parents for the sake of the children and to instill it in the children. And it just strikes me when you're saying that, that all of the tasks of the home are completely transformed if we have a spirit of piety, because then everything is a form of giving praise in recognition of a good father. So if you lived every day in every moment, practicing an awareness that, my father is good and he only gives me good things all the time, then everything that you do is in that. And Amen. so it, as parents, it's not just Amen. for the children, as parents, it completely changes our hearts and our experience of our household, which then of course would totally flow over to the children. Amen. 
Amen. So I wish we didn't have to move on, but we're gonna. But but and the nice thing is you have so well set up the connection between one and two. So it 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 is just this natural extension now, of that we've really kind of already begun to discuss, um, respect and obedience. And there's so many things to sort out that we that we're not going to be able to sort out here. But let's just why don't we say, first of all, piety towards God. It seems to me is a foundation of recognizing we're always most fundamentally as humans receivers. We're, we're being given what we have. Well, we come into life as children of parents and grandchildren of great of grandparents. Uh, we come in as the juniors. There are always elders. And so there's this, there's this amazing kind of bind and tie between kind of respect towards God and the sense that there's always that the important human sense again that was so clear in the ancients you have to respect all your elders mm -hmm. there's a kind of connection between the elders and the divine and even if we can't make explicit what that is you know scripture scripture says you know honor the hoary head and says it as though it's just a given mm -hmm. that 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 elders you know, are to be respected. And I, I, I think this is so important that we say it here as a non-negotiable, especially in this day and age, mm -hmm. where this is, I, I get the sense, and we've talked about this, um, that, that this is not so much done by parents anymore to be conveying adults are simply to be treated in a different way than your peers and that we convey to our children adults are simply because they're adults should be the object of a certain respect mm. i i'm just um in the middle of reading a gentleman in moscow and amor tolls literally just talks about that he's talking to a little nine-year-old girl the main character and he says she's um asking well why should we respect people who aren't connected to us and he said because every person who has come before you has contributed in some way to who you are and and the world that you live in not just your parents biologically but every person who has come before you has in some way built up and given to you the world that is yours and so it's a much more it's a sense of it's a, it's a sense of communal that that we live in a communal world that we don't live in a purely pragmatic world I owe something to the person who gives me something right now that it acknowledges and recognizes that we live in a much more communal world. That's a great, I, I, I love that way of putting it. And you know, sometimes there's, there's certain intangibles. There's, there's nothing wrong in parenting or recognizing sometimes, and even that this would be conveyed to the children or they'd come to see this, that we as parents have conviction that something's very important and the child, you know, of course I always say, why, why? Mm -hmm. And, and, it's the best we can in times that are fitting and it varies according to circumstance and age of the child to what extent we do try to give that why mm -hmm. ultimately we are trying to convey the why to our children mm -hmm. but there are times where we might say you know i can't i can't give you a philosophical explanation right mm -hmm. now I, I i can't articulate partially I, I don't completely understand it but this much i know in my heart that we respect people that are older and and, and so in, here's mm -hmm. a good example of, of of where certain things there might be there they should be deep-seated dispositions i say in a healthy culture this is enshrined in certain ways of course in manners and so forth which is a very important mm -hmm. aspect of how we express cultivate and pass this on but I mean, if there's one thing that's clear in tradition in in in, in transculturally is that the young should respect the old mm -hmm. and i i i i think that's a non-negotiable mm -hmm. we need to think about how that's expressed and there are things that could that, that, that can get in the way of that i can hear certain children saying or maybe even parents saying that um well but there's there's a there's many adults now that are bad if we just ch teach our children to respect all adults they could follow adults um down a wrong path mm -hmm. 
Would you have something to say then? Yeah. Well, if it, someone it, says that to you? Um, it, it's interesting. I find it immediately interiorly challenging to have that yeah. question put to yeah. me. Yeah. And um, I, I, I can't help but think, well, two things to respect someone doesn't necessarily mean that you say yes to everything that they do. So I think that that's helpful mm -hmm. to make a distinction. What does respect mean? Like, obviously there are certain exterior expressions of respect of a kind of a docility to be led by someone, but if fundamentally respecting someone doesn't, those things are not part of maybe essentially, would you say of what it means to respect someone? Cause you can respect someone or, offer them a certain yeah. kind of respect and still at the same time say, but I'm not going to follow your advice or, but I'm not going to pattern my life after you or, you know, Absolutely. so, 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 so somebody, if a child said to me, well, what about bad people? Do I have to respect bad people? Yes. In a certain sense you do. And maybe this goes back to the notion of piety because God is their maker and in some sense has given them to us. And so at least on that level, we have to show them a certain kind of respect. Yep. And I, I think it's excellent. And again, God has made clear, honor the hoary head. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, there's, it's just, it's an appropriate human disposition and that you then do make that distinction. It, it might be, it, it might be someone in the family it could mm -hmm. be an aunt or uncle sure. yeah. where um, we are, we are not going to speak badly of that person mm -hmm. that look, you know, respect, 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 mm -hmm. not yeah. saying you have to imitate them or do what they say or imitate them. Yeah. And, and that's going to be part of forming the children that that's, as you've just said, is very much still compatible with, with respect. And, and what you just said, kind of in a very practical way, especially if you have a member of the family who's doing something that is not, you don't want your children to follow is not appropriate, is not moral, is not, um, that there is a way that you can say something about their behavior and still respect them as a person. So I, again, that's a good distinction. I, I think it's good just when you said how you would explain it to a child. Well, we just respect all our elders. There may be certain things we don't explicitate, especially at certain ages. But for us as parents, it's good for us to understand what the nuance is so that when our child says, well, why do I need to respect aunt so-and-so if she's doing such and such? Right that in our heart, that we know why we can say to our child, because that's what is due to aunt so-and-so, right. that we respect her, right. which means it's interesting. This keeps going, flowing, bleeding down into the list further and further. We use kind words. We don't say unkind words. I was just, thinking, words, that, I was just <laughs> thinking that myself, as well as also to peers. It's also going to bleed down because then we're going to, part of kindness is going to be, we're going to be acting with respect even towards our peers. Yes. Which kind, kind of, of takes us demanded. back to piety yeah. towards God overflows and there, there's is, is going to be shown towards, you know, all people in different kinds of way, not yeah. piety per se. But I mean, yeah. because we're pious towards God, there is going to be a, a good treating, a rendering what is due. What exactly is that that's due? Well, different levels and kinds of respect due to different kind of connectedness. You said how we're mm -hmm. part of a community and even a connectedness by blood. Mm -hmm. is also itself a kind of heightened reason mm -hmm. for extra respect. But then regardless of blood, simply being an elder mm -hmm. is itself another reason, uh, kind of someone who's further along in the journey. So, so this, okay. So it, that we be conveying that we be thinking about that and recognizing that first of our, first of all, ourselves, mm -hmm. because again, each of these, the main way we're going to instill them is of course, by exemplifying them. Mm -hmm. And are, are, are we constantly working on having a respect towards our own, whatever it is, mm -hmm. parents, relatives, mm -hmm. you know, elders, we all have elders, right? right? Peers that, that, that and that our children see, it doesn't always come naturally, that we'll have to be overcoming ourselves, right? But we're going to, we're going to, we're going to pattern that first of all, ourselves, and be then making explicit and to some extent, quote, demanding. Again, we can't go into the details of exactly how, but I think in each of these, we at least let's start asking that question. Mm -hmm. How are we going to, in some way, demand? Mm -hmm. It will normally be in, in um, words that are used or not used. It might be in how we groom ourselves. It mm -hmm. might be in how we stand in the presence. It might be in how we listen 
et cetera, how we act at the table. These mm -hmm. particularly here, this one of respect, you know, will show up in manners often. Wow, that's just incredible. I hadn't really thought about that, but you totally kind of widened the lens. How many things are a matter of respect? Mm. Like you said, grooming. Wow, like that really widened the lens, of course. That is a matter of respect to those that we are with, that we groom ourselves properly and other matters. Yeah, of, we don't yeah. think about that, do, yeah. do, do we? That's, yeah. that, um... it, it just, I'm, I'm just, as we're talking about this, I just have to say that for me, it's very, very important to try to understand the principles involved because for me and my experience of trying to instruct our children, it's very exhausting and it's very, there's so many details that if I understand clearly why something is important, it makes it easier for me to have the courage to keep asking children because it's not because children yes, are bad right. or obdurate or impossible that we have to say it a million times. It's the nature of education that we have to say. And if we're blessed with more than one child, you're going to be multiplying that times however many children you have. And lo and behold, you feel like you've been saying it for the last 20 years. Right. And the reality is you have, and there's nothing wrong with anybody, but it takes a certain kind of fortitude to keep saying that and what right. gives me fortitude to keep encouraging certain habits or saying it over and over again is for me to understand, wait, this is why it's important. Yes, so, exactly. I, you know, even exactly. as we're talking about it, I'm just realizing for myself as a parent to understand why we ask certain things of our children in this list is kind of giving the why, so to speak, so that well, we at least have the starting fortitude. asking that question. Yeah. Right. And, and it's interesting in asking the question, it does, it is interesting that it seems to blossom out into so many different areas, right. Right. you know, right. you start no, with I, one I, and it blossoms into others. And isn't this yet another instance of the gift that we love to recognize of just that we're called upon to instill this in our children is one of the main ways we're going to have the opportunity to come to a better understanding yeah. of it ourselves and grow in ourselves. This is the yeah. divine plan. All of these dispositions obviously are central to our life. And, and our discussing it with one another hopefully will lead us to say, what are we doing to, to do these things better ourselves? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and very, it's going to get very concrete. You know, that one, we can't go on to it more. We have a discussion about that maybe another time. Something like even just how we dress, mm -hmm. th th that someone would say, I'm not going to go to someone's house dressed like that mm -hmm. out of respect for them, mm -hmm. period. Yeah. You know, yeah. just, 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 yeah. just, just something like that yeah. can be a very, very strong way of conveying that. Yeah. The, the respect, you want to say something? Go ahead. No, I was no. just actually um, wondering how, why you connected obedience with respect well, in well, the same, or how the two connect and why you Yeah, put them well, we could, we, we, could, we could have separated it out. And mm -hmm. I, I like the number five more than I like the <laughs> number six. And so, you know, that's kind of that going on. I mean, we could just, I mean, you know, we could call this 2A and 2B. But I mean, obedience, of course, there's a very unique respect that's owed to parents, but obedience is more than respect. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I, I think here, let's, let's, let's keep this, let's just, Keep this brief. I'd say almost that's one of the most obvious ones on here, and it, it deserves a lot more discussion. That our children have instilled in them that in God's great plan, certain people have authority over me, and that's a gift. And the response to authority is to obey. Mm -hmm. And this is this is one of the hardest things as humans to do. Um, we, we find something that's kind of rebelling against that. Uh, you know, of course, obedience is a foundational attitude. Once again, connecting back to piety towards God, not only are we pious <laughs> towards God, I mean, very much a matter of rendering things to him is also part of what we render to him is obedience to his commands. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, one of his commands is to honor our parents and clearly part of honoring our parents is also obeying our parents mm -hmm. and and so just to have started the question how do we how do we encourage a spirit of obedience without i'll put it this way without it being a spirit of servility mm -hmm. some people might mm -hmm. be concerned I don't, you know, I want my child to be strong. I don't want my child to be the person that's always says, oh, oh, oh yes, oh, oh, you, I have to do that. Oh, I have to do that. Mm -hmm. And just doing what other people tell them. I don't want my mm -hmm. child to be someone that does what other people tells them. But be really careful with that. This is where we have to learn how to sort that out. Mm -hmm. in, in some important sense, we absolutely want our children to be the kind of person 
that does what other people tell them, meaning the right people in the right context where there's, there is an obvious, a natural or humanly established authority that is appropriate, that that's central to human flourishing is to learn that we have to receive direction first from God, but in God's providence, part of how he directs us. St. Thomas Aquinas is explicit on this, part of how God directs us is by putting other humans in our life who have authority over us. So in a sense, it's, it's part of learning obedience to God to learn obedience to them. And that does not lead to servility. I love to quote Aristotle on this, that in fact, only he who has first well learned obedience will ever be a good commander. Mm. Wow. That's really, really amazing. So at first blush, when you look at it, it seemed like in this list, obedience is the one characteristic or um, I don't want to say virtue, disposition, disposition that we're trying to form in children out of this whole list. It seems to be the one that seems to be explicitly oriented toward being a child. But from what you're saying, it sounds like what you're saying that obedience, just like piety and respect and a work ethic and gratitude and kindness are actually things that we're instilling in our children for, for their character, not just for their moment Ab as a child. Ab absolutely. Well said. Okay. Well said. And, and so obedience towards parents is a foundational, particularly fundamental, central, formative kind of obedience that will, it's, let's put it this way, that will um, step back, will fade away. Mm -hmm. Adults don't need to be, they still need to honor, but they don't anymore need to obey their parents. Mm -hmm. But that, that obedience to parents fades away. It transitions to and it grounds a broader obedience that always remains mm -hmm. towards, first of all, God, and there's always also appropriate human and spiritual authority under which we must live mm -hmm. and, and 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 that is an incredibly rich part of human life bear in mind christian there are three things in the in the gospel that are called the evangelical councils poverty chastity and obedience and uh, uh, those all have a place in everybody's life mm -hmm. there's a kind of poverty there's a very important kind of chastity and obedience remains mm. something central according to our state in life. Mm. I just, um, as you're saying it, I'm just thinking, you know, we talked about piety. Obviously, there are certain external manifestations of piety. But then what we were trying to hone in, what's the spirit of party, piety? What's at the heart? What is the way our heart is going to be formed that makes it part of a, our character? And so when you're talking about obedience, it seems to me like maybe the um, kind of interior disposition that obedience fosters is one of receptivity of maybe receiving formation from someone else, which actually, it seems to me like would be an unbelievably, as a matter of fact, foundational attitude you would want every person to have as they go through life. Maybe first as children, it's for kind of primarily in relation to their parent, but think about as an adult going into the world, you know, going into the natural world, I'm going to receive something from the structure of the world around me. You know, plants need water. It's kind of an obedience to follow their design in nature. We have to observe it. We have to discover it. But it's if our, our attitude has to be one of, tell me more about you so I know how I can best serve you. And obedience is to learn, to, to learn from everything that's given to us. So I don't know, it just all of a sudden it seems like it's a much bigger thing than just following rules. Yeah, and I wonder if maybe that's the way to get around the spirit of servility in obedience is that if we realize that obedience is fundamentally an interior disposition to be formed by something else. Yeah. I, I absolutely assent to that. The, on, the only thing that I, I think, and my voice has these wonderful, rich and challenging subtleties, I think that's 100% true, while we still have to keep the appropriate distinction of obedience in a fuller sense is 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 something obviously distinct. I mean, I'm yeah. obedient towards the directions of sure. my parents and legitimate authority. 
in a way that simply does not obtain. I'm not obedient to trees. No, no, so, of so, course. So, and right. I'm not saying you were suggesting yes. that, but all, all no, I'm but saying- No, but it's great but, to make that distinction. But, but we have to keep that distinction, but recognize, I think your excellent, um, really neat insight there is it, 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 by a kind of a wonderful deep magic, mm -hmm. the, the appropriate disposition towards obedient of obedience towards authority is deeply intertwined with, connected with, and cultivates at the same time this kind of openness and receptivity to learn more generally um, from you know, kind of across the board. Mm -hmm. I, I mm -hmm. think that's a I think that's a wonderful point uh, of each of these is it, this, the disposition will will overflow into other things and interconnect with the others. Mm -hmm. So, so let, let, let's, let's have another conversation, another time yeah, about obedience, because that's well, well, well worth doing. And it's so but, hairy. Um, I mean, so this next three, we're, we're, I, it's painful for us. It's hard. We, I want to just keep discussing them, but yeah. I, I think we have to be briefer um, on these next three, but I hope we have a good foundation for the ones we've done from the ones we've done. So the three, four and five, again, are responsibility, kind of good work ethic, kindness, and gratitude. I think we can, um, I, be kind of straightforward on good work ethic, responsibility. It, 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 I think we all kind of know what we mean there. It, it, you immediately recognize in a person that this person can be counted on to kind of give it his all, to put his heart into it. He's willing. He's willing to work. He's willing to be a part of the team. Yeah, th th this is a, a huge thing in pretty much any area of life. Someone who comes into the situation and has an attitude of how can I be part of what's going on here and contribute to it by what I do. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems to me that, that that's a way of saying broadly what a good work ethic is here is mm -hmm. this is the guy you certainly want on your team at the business mm -hmm. you want on your team and in in, in in sports someone who's going to work hard put his put his heart into it and and this is that one of those things that sometimes you know we find certain maybe of our children being more this way than others where there's certain natural dispositions it, it, it absolutely yeah. does but surely it is something we are trying to instill in them of hey this is something, and again, I said, in some sense, all these come under broadly a justice. Mm -hmm. We owe it, given who we are, given the community that we belong to. We owe to others to have a good work ethic. Mm -hmm. Our good work ethic is not fundamentally about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Responsibility is ultimately not something I have to myself. Responsibility is something I have towards others. Mm -hmm. And you know, at the end of the day, the person who seems to have a good work ethic simply because he's trying to get ahead in life that's not what I'm going to call really a good mm -hmm. work ethic. Mm -hmm. the, the, we're, we're training people up. We're willing to work hard as a way of giving, mm -hmm. as a way of being part of the community, as a way of serving. This is responsibility. I owe something and I, and I will happily give something here. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we're going to have to pattern that. And we're going to have to be asking ourselves this question as you and I have through the years. And it's hard. It's kind of mm -hmm. intangible. We've said to ourselves, wow, this is a really hard one. Mm -hmm. How are we going to get that in our children mm -hmm. or encourage it? Um, this one also, in this point, you kind of divide it into two. You said responsibility, work ethic. And they are kind of obviously very much related, but they are different too. It strikes me that on the one hand, you started by talking about work ethic about being, you know, the attitude of being part of a community, carrying a burden communally, et cetera, et cetera. But responsibility seems like it's something that's prior to that because it's taking, well, I don't know, help me define what that means. I mean, you said responsibility is something we actually owe to someone else. That's really, it, it's, that's very, that was, that's very interesting. Yeah. That, I, I, and I, I think that's it how it relates it to work ethic, but it, it, responsibility is taking the burden of the completion of something. I mean, if we're talking about work, it's like um, taking ownership yeah, of the thing. Exactly. And, yeah. and, and, and I wonder if the key to helping a child to understand they have ownership of a particular task or whatever is to realize that I have to take ownership for how this is done because I owe something to the people for whom I'm doing it. You know, in the case of a child, it's definitely in relationship to the household. Yeah, yeah. And because yeah, and, yeah. and, otherwise, mm -hmm. how you say to a child, mm -hmm. why, you know, if a child is doing a random chore, you know, let, you know, weed the pea gravel, that that's your chore for the day. I mean, 
no one's going to die if I don't get close enough to the lavender underneath and get out those weeds. But if you begin to recognize, I have been given this task in relation to my mother who's asked me to do this yep. as part of contributing yep. to the household, then all of a sudden your mother becomes involved. It's the person of your mother. It's not just about the weeds, right? And I wonder if that's part of the reason where we have sometimes failed in, in particular tasks getting done with our children is that maybe we haven't helped them see that the task is not just about, it is very much about getting this practical thing done, but it is connected to the bigger picture. I think that's, I think that's, I think that's great. I, I, I have struggled uh, um, uh, in defining responsibility, quick story. Um, in the course I teach on family and household, we read Xenophon in, in Xenophon's great work called The Estate Manager. Um, one of the characters conveys that the fundamental thing that was taught to me in my home was to be responsible. That, that was the way this character summed up my, um, I was taught to be responsible. And, and then I, I had to, no definition is given. Ah, so I, tell me I, more. I mean, I took, I took it as this, I, 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 whether this is perfect or, or fitting, sure can be improved upon the way that I uh, try to say what responsibility there means is I take it as mine. I take it as mine that I must see to this task for the sake of others. Or another way of putting it is I recognize that I owe to others that I take this thing as mine to do. Mm -hmm. I, th I, I think that's yeah. a reasonable way. And, that, and that yeah. you, that's what you just expressed yeah. by saying, you know, take, taking ownership, sense of responsibility. Someone comes upon a situation where something needs to be done, have a sense of, wait, it, you ask yourself, someone has a sense of responsibility, ask himself kind of naturally, wait, so let's say, can I give a hand here? But is it in fact even mine? Sometimes we'll go beyond what we're responsible for. Mm -hmm. But, but for that, that foundation, is, is it given to me that I, that I need, that I owe in some mm -hmm. sense to attend to this. Yeah, I, I just, I'm just right now as we're talking about it, I'm just thinking about the expanse of a child's life full of all kinds of chores that you give them and all kinds of, you know, whatever. I'm just thinking about our children. We have six children. So it's been many years of many niggling chores here and there. And just for a child, how it just becomes the sea of things he has to do if it's untethered to a bigger picture. And that maybe our role as parents is to be bringing the bigger picture, bringing it in mind to them all the time. Not it's, you know, you don't need to be full, like lecturing them every time you just need them to pick up their tinker toys. But, um, but I, I do think that that is something that, you know, would be part of a conversation within a household that we all see all of the tasks within a household because often yep. responsibility or work ethic in, in a household very much takes the shape of tasks in the home. Right. Obviously yes. work ethics, and work ethic should. can be yep. broader and, and responsibility certainly will be broader, but within the home, all of us, husband, wife, children experience kind of that through the work of the home. And that if we periodically stop and give a retrospective for everybody, not yeah, just for the parents absolutely. who need it desperately, but also for the children, it provides a context in which they can also have the opportunity to experience the completion of their task well as something more than just having gotten every weed out from under the lavender. I've actually given something to the household or the family. Yeah. So, so, so then they begin Amen. to enjoy and, and actually take pleasure in their work because when they complete it and they complete it well, they actually take pride in it versus the untethered work mm -hmm. of just get it done. I, Why? Yeah. Why and who cares, you know, type of thing. I, I, I think what, and what really strikes me in your putting it that way is this brings us back to one of the most foundational principles that we talk about all the time. The more that our household, our home is a shared human community project, uh, as it were, a shared life together, the much easier it's going to be to convey to them that this is your part in what we do together here. 
Mm -hmm. The more I think about that, I think this is really striking me right now of, of why here's an account, one account, one approach to why there's so little of a sense of responsibility of anybody anymore. The place that you most naturally learn to be responsible is where there is, is something that will very naturally say to you, I owe something to this group to take this as mine to do. Mm -hmm. I owe something to these people, to this, to this reality Mm -hmm. right here. But our homes have been eviscerated, mm-hmm. and 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 I mean, think a latchkey child. I mean, what, what, how is he going to experience that? He to what does he owe something? I mean, cleaning his room is going to seem o- almost more like just like cleaning an office for somebody else. Because mm-hmm. what what? The, in other words, I don't want mean mean to be too extreme there, but just to set up kind of a scale. The more that home is a place of shared, rich life, joyful life much, much more will we be able to convey and will the child experience, I owe, and, 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 and I'm happy to, mm-hmm. because I have the gift, the privilege, the honor of being part of this community, I actually have the privilege, again, kind of, it's a privilege to owe, to have as my part, I get to do this part on this team, mm-hmm. as yeah. it were, yeah. and that should be our spirit in our home. Yeah. Oh, so, sounds like oh. someone's calling. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 will, like someone's calling. <laughs> I will say that um, one thing that this is totally answers a discomfort that I have, I've had in my mind in relation to the notion of work ethic, because work ethic is usually synonymous with a hard worker, someone who works hard. And I've always felt a little bit uncomfortable about that because I just keep going. And what is productivity the primary yes, measure great, there? No, great, well said. And so, and so are we just, is, is the goal to create productive workers, which is so terrifying to me because, you know, the, the, the kind of specter of the workaholic who's simply producing, who is praised for producing so prolifically all the time, but who has no life. There's no, there's no yeah, communal yeah, yeah, right, experience. Right, there's right. no pause. There's no reflection. There's no receiving, you know, so do we want to create, is that what our goal is when we say we want to create children with work ethic to create these like powerhouse. And, and that's where you're really sunk if you don't have a very healthy, figure, physically vigorous and choleric child. You know, temperament is really going to undo you if the goal is simply to make someone who's that's, a hard worker. That's a great and point. So and so we that, need to distinguish hard working from work ethic. For, for apps, great point. And, and again, I mean, and really realizing here, we could have had a, a, a unique discussion on each one of these. And, yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, I mean, sorry. <laughs> good, good, good work ethic um, can be absolutely misunderstood. It, 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 communists want their citizens to have a good work ethic, right? You know, and the, it always the, fails. The, 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 you know, the, the businessman who's, who over prioritizes business success it's wants his son to have a good work ethic, uh, you know, for, for what sake? For the sake of business success. And, and 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 fundamentally, or primarily for that, and that would never be what you were calling a good work ethic. Right. The good work ethic here is always, most of all, rooted in serving people. Mm-hmm. Now, doing well in business can be a, a way of serving people, but it needs to be that. Yeah. A way of serving yeah. people, and that's yeah. what I'm just saying. There can be a good quote, good work ethic. So, so there's something for parents to. Think about what are we working for anyway? Why do we want them to be hard workers? And mm-hmm. again, I think the more we get home right, the more that's going to be precisely yeah. where we teach them the priority of persons and their flourishing. And we have a responsibility always first for persons. That's why we work hard. Yeah, that's great. Wow. Lots All right, of well, clarity then, on that. Then, you know, again, maybe we'll have to have to circle back and do it. Uh, um, do more on, on these individually, but let's, 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 let's look at the fourth and the fifth are kindness and gratitude. You have always had a specific conviction about the importance of instilling kindness in children. Mm-hmm. So can you just, can you just tell us why? You know, it's, it's, it was very instinctual for me when we started doing this and at raising our children, it just became very apparent to me that living in a household where the words that are being um, shared are kind versus unkind for me as a mother, was just a much better place to live. So kind of intuitively, pragmatically, but as I think about it and to explain it, it's almost like kindness is the necessary seedbed for every single other one. There's an interior docility toward, it's it's kind of um, demands an automatic awareness of the other person. 
why would I be kind? My mother used to always say, never hurt anyone's heart. Like that was, that was just over and over. never hurt anyone's heart. She didn't just, she didn't descend into the details. Don't use that word. Don't use that word. I mean, sometimes obviously there were certain words that couldn't be said, but as a principle, never hurt anyone's heart. If you think about that, that makes you kind of radically aware of the other person mm. in your daily interaction. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. to practice kindness is to practice a kind of radical awareness that I'm sharing this space, this life, this home with other people. They have their persons too. They have feelings. So I then treat them res with respect. You know, kindness is kind of teaches you a certain kind of restraint of your passions in consideration of the other. And that seems to be really kind of fundamental and essential right. to all kinds of yep. other things, like why I would, you know, wipe the kitchen counter a little bit better because I'm aware of the other people in my environment. So, and it provides a kind of space in which the heart can stay vulnerable. So not only the heart of those receiving your words can stay vulnerable because they're not constantly protecting themselves, but your heart also stays vulnerable. And so all of a sudden it provides this environment in which the home becomes a place where to share the heart is a normal thing. It's something that um, is welcome. It's something that people stay vulnerable to. So it just creates an incredible mm. environment in which people can live interpenetrated, mm. not just on the work level, but on the heart level. Wow, that was amazing. I, I, I'm very, very struck by that. Um, particularly that last point when you have, and it's just, it just seems so apparent to me on you're saying it when you have children, especially who are kind to one another, it allows a kind of sensitivity and openness to reality. Picture the child who like a flower in an unkind mm -hmm. environment just closes, mm -hmm. particularly if it's a very sensitive child. Mm -hmm. Um, but that we all should be sensitive yeah. in certain key ways. And indeed, instilling kindness it, it, it is a way of instilling an appropriate, as you say, sensitivity to others. I, I, I love that way of putting it. it. It struck me in certain ways, this also is a matter of justice. This is owed. Mm -hmm. we, we, we need, we owe kindness to other people that a, a, a certain warmth, a certain protection of their heart. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you know, I love how you just said what your, what your mother always said. It, it, and that's a very simple thing. It, this gives us direction. How do you instill kindness in our children? Of course, there's the obvious thing of, of again, being called to the next level ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. are, are, are we barking? I mean, if we were yeah. brought up in yeah, an yeah, unkind yeah, yeah. environment, do we tend to bark at people? Do we bark at our... Or bark we at our often children take discipline as a justification for unkindness oh man yeah. i i i mean it, it, a kind of hardness do we steal our, our our heart versus versus keeping ourselves vulnerable i mean to be kind is it, it will is always a kind of vulnerability but vulnerability is that openness it, it, it makes you it mean wound it literally means woundable but it, it means that you're open to receive Receiving, people and yeah. and things yeah as they are, which mm -hmm. it, it is sure, kind people uh, might be more tend to be hurt themselves. Mm -hmm. That Well, gosh, if we make our children kind, we're setting them up to be, you know, to suffer from the unkindness of others. On the one hand, but it shouldn't be, I really don't think that kindness should be equated with um, undiscerning or incapable of protecting yourself. Or like when I say undiscerning, I mean, it makes a big difference when you can say, when someone says something unkind to you or does something unkind, that was inappropriate. Sure. You should not have said that. I mean, a kind person is perfectly capable of defending themselves. And, and as a matter of fact- keeping boundaries, as you like to point out often. Yes. Too. And as a matter of fact, growing up in a kind environment is the perfect place in which you learn both vulnerability, but at the same time, an awareness of saying, no, you can't do that to me. No, that's not appropriate. And so, you know, someone who is tenderhearted but doesn't particularly grow up in a kind environment seems to me never develops the skill of protecting himself or, or the way you protect yourself is to close your heart entirely mm. because that's part of a healthy emotional immune system. If someone says something unkind that hurts your heart, you should close your heart. 
right? That's in a part sense, of in a yeah. sense, right? I mean, I mean not, not you should right. in the right. sense of one up, but that is a, that that's part of a healthy emotional immune system. And so, I think actually in a truly kind environment where it's not overly gushing, over compliment. I'm not saying we're not talking about that. We're just talking about never hurt anyone's heart. Carry their heart in your hand, you know. Then then it provides an environment in which people can develop the strength and the courage to protect themselves where necessary and keep their heart vulnerable. I think that's, I, th I, th I think that's great. And, 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 and just that we'd be thinking in those terms is already a, a long way towards starting to do that with our children, do it with ourselves, yeah. do it ourselves. Kindness and then, between spouses and, and then good, deal. good, good point. Good yeah. point dear. You're going to have to work on that. <laughs> um, and, um, in how how are we going to step in? And it's hard to correct on kindness. Stop it, you know. But yeah, yeah. but 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 we do. You you may not be unkind. Yes, in that way. Exactly. I mean I mean that that you know, again. Right now, I'm going to sweat. Exactly. How do you how do you enforce yeah. that? that? That that we say times speak from our authority. That 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 was mm -hmm. unkind. Yes. I'm going to ask you not to, not to speak that way. Yeah. You may not say that to your sister or if you're very so, upset, let's find a more creative way to express that. Um, yeah, that's, that's, I mean, the phrase never hurt anyone's heart. My mom would just drop it right in the middle of a horrible interaction between siblings. Children never hurt anyone's heart. And it was patently obvious. What and needed to great. be excised. And, and, you know, one might point out, well, in certain ways, sometimes you have to hurt someone's heart. Okay, fine. No, no, Th that, no, no, that's that obvious. About, I mean, that's just different. Yeah. It's obvious what your mother meant. Yes, yes. And and and, and, and in that context, like I nobody mean, nobody was yeah. an idiot. Everybody no, knew what no, she was you referring can, to. You can put that one in the bank, it seems yeah. to me. Yeah. All right. All right. Gratitude, just in, 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 in wrapping up, you know, your your father taught us, you you won't spoil a child if you teach a child to be grateful. You, we, you and I have come back to that line so often. Gratitude in many ways is this foundational uh, disposition that is so beautiful, that's so central. Someone who lives his life in gratitude. I've started to make that an object of prayer, by the way. Lord, just help me to be more grateful. Help me to live my life in gratitude. In so many ways, this, I think, connects back to, to piety. We have a father and everything from him is gift. Mm-hmm. And the gift, the kind of the first thing that a gift calls for is that we'd be grateful for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love mm. a line from St. Thomas, being grateful for what we receive is the disposition to be able to receive more. Mm. Wow. You know, if we yeah. think about it that way, you could say, God has a lot more that he wants to give us. Mm -hmm. Are we becoming grateful is a way of becoming capable. This isn't just, okay, now you're grateful. No, great. Now I'll give you more. Yeah. I mean, it really, it, it's, it, he it, who it, has, it's, more will be given to him. Yeah. I, I mean, I just, yeah. it, isn't there something neat in, in St. Thomas? He says it's a disposition that makes you capable of receiving more. It, 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 it's not, to, it's not the demands more. It's not just that the, the, the giver just says, okay, I'm so glad you're grateful, but it literally in us now is a kind of this wonderful disposition of heart that again, and how just to keep thinking about how I am more able to be what God wants me to be mm -hmm. to the extent that my fundamental, a fundamental disposition of my soul is. Is, is, is thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. I give you thanks. Mm -hmm. I give you thanks. Mm -hmm. I loved what you said that um, it's a gift that calls forth gratitude from us because it seems to me that that is a very helpful kind of almost direction in thinking about how do we instill it in children because um, it seems that it's something that we induce from our children rather than demand yeah, for them to do, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, it has yes. to be something that's called yeah. forth. And so we have to c create an environment when children are very little, teaching them to say thank you for something is actually not a form of demanding them to be grateful, is a very important way of drawing their attention to when yes, gratitude yeah. is appropriate. Yes. So when they're very, very little, say, please say, oh, did you say thank you? Oh, did you say thank you to Bobsia for that? You know, oh, say thank you to mama. Um, that's, that's, catching the moment, their experiential moment and saying, oh, this is the kind of moment 
that calls forth your gratitude. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of orients them or crystallizes a moment in which gratitude is appropriate. And then maybe as they get older, um, there's a way in which we can kind of bring to their attention how wonderful this is. Or look, oh, this was so completely, it didn't need to happen this way. And it did. Or even the notion of if someone gives a gift, it's so obvious. We almost don't even need to explain it to a child. It's gratuitous. But, you know, sadly, sometimes you do even need to explicitate that. Wow. Grandma certainly didn't need to do that. That was so generous yes. of her yep. to have brought that for you. Let's write her a thank you note. So, you know, it, that kind of, it, so it seems that our job is to be, to, to turn our child's gaze toward that moment of be, something being called kind of calling us to a certain Amen. kind of that's it. Okay. Thank you. That, that's a, 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 I, I let you really struck me and said, if, if there's one thing you cannot demand, you can't, you can't demand that someone be grateful mm -hmm. uh, um, or, 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 um, or in any case, you certainly can't force it. Right. But, 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 but we might, but we might, we might demand um, certain um, traditional signs. Right in manners and you know so this whole right. this whole wonderful the, the exterior signs you just gave a great example the concrete things how we're we gonna how we're we gonna cultivate and encourage gratitude in writing thank you letters mm -hmm. we might say to our children you need to write a thank you letter yes. and and it's just because why do i have to write that thank you letter because this is something we do because it's appropriate Mm -hmm. and at some point, we might even say, "I'm not saying that you have to be grateful. I'm inviting you to be grateful, and but I'm telling you to write, you to write a thank you, thank you, uh, a thank yes. you letter." I, I, yes. I mean, because to say thank you is the appropriate response to a free and generous gift. That's why we have to write and, a thank you note. And 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 so, the, so so many of these things we've been talking about here. Think of every one of them. There's exterior signs. There's manners. Taking manners in a in in a broad sense. Mm. They're going to be bodily. Uh, ways or yeah. or ritual ways and words um signs that we that we that we express these things and with the young we start to give them the signs to express a reality that we're trying to cultivate through that sign mm -hmm. and i think that, that that that's part of the art of instilling these things yeah is it is to utilize that in an appropriate mm -hmm. way yeah and to always to allow the signs for us when we're when we're conveying them to our children for us to remember the inner meaning of the sign because very often the sign just becomes this empty thing that becomes the standard by which my family is judged are they polite are they well-mannered etc <clears throat> that may be how people externally judge that but for us as parents Good if point. we can re keep in mind Great point. and you know by either discussing or talking about it or when the child says why do i have to write a thank you note it's this moment that calls me as the parent back to why does he have to write a thank you note? Oh, because to say thank you is the appropriate recognition of the free gift that was given. Yeah. And then, and that keeps the signs from becoming empty shells. I, 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 that, that's a great point. And I, and I love it. And we probably should end with, I love your point of, uh, again, it always goes back to the marriage first and, and what we're being called to do. Um, let's, we're sign makers. And let's, the more that we are true to the dispositions that should be there behind the sign, the more we are going to be, those signs will more influence those yeah, around us, our children. Yeah. And, and, and they'll literally, they'll, they'll notice that. They'll notice that I, I should, I should be sincere mm -hmm. when I do any of these things. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that connection between the sign and the reality is a, a really big part mm -hmm. of their starting to have the realities here that we are trying to instill in them. So as we wrap up, just read the five, the five characteristics okay. to instill in um, your child. Uh, Non-negotiable. Uh, once again, we started with piety, uh -huh. and then we went to respect and kind of squeezed obedience in there with it. Mm -hmm. Then we went to responsibility which is the broad, rich one that has a more specific instance of the good work ethic. Mm -hmm. Then we did kindness and then we have gratitude. Awesome. We're Great open list. to other ones yeah. and don't hesitate to give us suggestions and maybe we, we need to revise this list or we can have more discussions about things that aren't on this list. Yeah. And as Great. always, it's total springboard for more conversation. Yes, indeed. Great to be with you all. Take care.
Thanks for tuning in this episode of The Intentional Household. If you've enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, and leave a rating or review. If you have any topic requests, please send them to lifecraftgroup at gmail.com. For our Wednesday reflections, free courses, reading groups, and live events, please visit life-craft.org.